Today, Nature v Markets, the DFA Daily for the 25th of April 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the latest posts covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today is Anzac Day, and I wanted to pause to recognise those who sacrificed themselves for our country. I pay my respects to all those who helped to build our freedoms in Australia and those who died in this cause. And remember, freedoms are hard won but can be taken away so quickly, one reason why we are committed to helping to shed light on current events. We shall not forget. To all past, present and future heroes, we pay our respects. According to Westpac, while the RBA's forecast for growth in 2021 is 6-7%, to Westpac says it's nearer 4%. They say it appears that next year we are headed for a repeat of the last few years when the RBA growth forecasts are consistently above Westpac's forecasts. That bullish view is despite the observation that the twin health and economic emergencies that we're experiencing now will cast a shadow over our economy for some time to come. The other key observation was around the outlook for interest rates. The governor indicated they expected the three-year bond target to remain in place for a number of years, and he also reiterated that the cash rate target would not be lifted before the three-year bond yield target was lifted. The choice of the three-year bond target rate as the same as the cash rate target is strategic since it sends a clear message that if the bank is prepared to purchase three-year bonds at the overnight cash rate, it is reasonable to expect that it is comfortable with the cash rate holding at 0.25% for the full three years. And before the shutdown, mortgage arrears were already rising again, according to the Standard & Poor's Spin Index. Australian prime mortgage arrears increased to 1.41% in February from 1.36% a month earlier. Arrears typically rise in February, reflecting the end of the summer holidays and post-Christmas spending period, and increases in arrears were more pronounced in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria, reflecting the effect of the bushfires, drought and a decline in international tourism in larger coastal areas after the onset of the virus. Social distancing measures to slow the spread of the virus did not come into effect until mid-March, meaning the effect on mortgage arrears won't be reflected until future reporting periods. Data for April and, to a lesser extent, March will provide some insights into the effect on borrowers' debt serviceability since the large disruptions to business activity. Many lenders are offering a variety of temporary mortgage payment relief measures to borrowers whose income has been affected by the virus. The true effect of increased financial hardship due to the virus will not be reflected in traditional arrears reporting until at least the third quarter of 2020. And this is because lenders are not required to report loans under virus arrangements as being in arrears during the defined mortgage relief period. And many lenders are adjusting their reporting systems to track the level of hardship applications and the duration of these arrangements. However, based on initial observations from data provided by some lenders, around 3 to 7% of loans in securitised trusts are under virus hardship arrangements. And they expect the level to increase in the coming months, but the rate of increase will likely slow and depend upon the economic path to recovery. The large forecast increases in unemployment for 2020 will lead to rises in arrears and defaults in the next 12 to 18 months, albeit from low levels. And mortgage payment relief measures will help to cushion some of the effects of rising unemployment on household debt serviceability. A longer path to economic recovery, though, could diminish the efficacy of these measures over time. Though, As the Financial Review discussed, it's hard to read what the impact on the banks will be. 
If the published results of stress tests are to be believed, our banks can withstand the expected fallout from the virus, and so far the official comments suggest that while dividends may have to be cut, the forecast losses are manageable. Tom Nung of Black Peak Capital, who dealt with troubled banks in the Bank of England, examined just how durable Australian bank stress test assumptions were. Assuming Commonwealth Bank of Australia's severe scenario of 30% house price falls and 11% unemployment, the Big Four expects to lose $15.7 billion cumulative over three years after lenders' mortgage insurance claims. Now that might seem large, but in the context of $20 billion of annual dividends paid, the task of absorbing losses in this scenario are manageable. But he says one important issue has been overlooked, and one he experienced firsthand, and that is the potential for the risk-weighted assets of the banks to increase quite significantly, putting additional strain on capital ratios. The amount of capital a bank must hold is a function of their risk-weighted assets. The largest banks are allowed to use internal models to risk-weight their balance sheet assets. The safer the asset, the more its value is discounted, reducing the amount of capital that must be held. For this reason, Australia's banks have learnt to love mortgages. For every $500,000 mortgage, a major bank typically holds just $12,500 of equity. But in a scenario where house prices fall, the loan-to-value ratios increase and the risk weights in the internal models increase, resulting in holding more capital against a loan. Combine this with rising arrears and risk weights can go up sharply, increasing the size of the asset base relative to the capital held. This highlights the pro-cyclicality of bank capital ratios. While losses are increasing, capital levels are declining. But as assets are becoming riskier, their weights are increasing. A falling numerator and a rising denominator is a double whammy for bank capital ratios because it's capital divided by assets. Now, according to Evans & Partners research, for a safe $500,000 mortgage, a bank only needs to hold $2,900 in capital, but it can go up to $7,000 if a loan becomes slightly less safe. That can then increase to $11,000 if the mortgage becomes risky and to $45,000 if the loan migrates into the stressed bucket. The number increases to $62,500 if it's close to default. The biggest risk seems to be a migration of mortgages from a risky bucket to a stressed bucket, where a fourfold increase in capital is required. Forbearance can help avoid or simply just delay this move, and while stress testing is the domain of the prudential regulator, the Reserve Bank of Australia conducted its own tests back in 2017. The RBA made three interesting observations. First, cutting dividends is an important cushion in a stress scenario until profits fall to zero. Then losses eat directly into capital. The second is that changes in risk weights have twice as much impact on capital ratios as credit losses in a severe scenario. And the third is that so long as banks can continue to generate profits and capital, they can reduce the impact of credit losses. For investors and regulators, stress tests are important but they are also as much as an art as they are a science. And a reminder of this is Spain's Banco Popular, which essentially failed in 2017 within 12 months of passing a stress test that assumed a more severe scenario. Some analysts, like Douglas Orr of Endeavour Equities, argue stress tests have long suffered from disaster myopia and believes the pandemic reality of unemployment and output contraction exceeds the worst of the stress tests. The conditions, he said, could easily end up being twice as bad, which means significant capital raisings are on the cards, with the massive fiscal stimulus unleashed attempting to tame the impact of the crisis. It is at least six months until we see how close we actually get. The only thing we know now is that this is no longer a drill.
And Christopher Joy wrote that if Australia was about to experience a multi-year downturn precipitated by China imploding or high inflation and rising interest rates, he would expect a 20 to 40% drawdown in the value of our bricks and mortar, powered by the mother of all deleveraging processes. But he says, this is not where we stand today. The big intellectual question is the likely course of the virus. Whereas some advise politicians that the peak of new infections would not be for months and most Australians would get infected, it turned out that the new infections in Australia peaked on March the 28th and they're starting rolling over in the US on April the 11th. Most of Europe had reached its zenith by the middle of the month. So in his view, Australia would pivot away from the proposed six months business hibernation plan, which would have been positively catastrophic, towards an early exit from containment after one to two months lockdown. The Prime Minister, he says, appears to have pragmatically embraced this logic after flattening our infection curve with the commencement of Operation Kickstart slated for some time in May. This is important for the housing market trajectory too. A one to two month lockdown followed by an assertive effort to get workers back into their jobs will minimise the quantum of mortgage arrears and losses, he says. In this crisis, unemployment has also risen most noticeably amongst the casualised, non-home owning labour force. Combined with the fact that the banks have been given the green light to offer six month repayment holidays without having to hold more capital against these loans or report them as arrears, we are unlikely to see large swathes of forced sellers. Because almost all borrowers are on variable rate loans or short term fixed rate products, Australia's housing market is one of the most interest rate elastic in the world. The prospect of multiple RBA rate cuts is what motivated our call for a 10% increase in prices in April last year. Monetary policy easing since June 2019 has reduced new fixed and variable mortgage rates by between 75 and 150 basis points, which, according to the RBA's internal house price modelling, should push values up by between 20 and 30%. Since prices troughed nationally in July 2019, they've jumped by about 11%. If there's one asset class that has performed exceptionally well, he said, it is local bricks and mortar, as shown by the CoreLogic Index, which indicates that Sydney and Brisbane prices continue climbing through March and April. In Sydney, we are just starting to see some evidence of flatlining, he says, and in Melbourne, prices have moved sideways since mid-March, but show no signs of any striking deterioration. When auction clearance rates have plummeted, that is because of the lockdown. In the absence of serious housing stress, vendors are choosing to pull listings and exercise the option to wait. I expect that once we come out of containment in May, the current housing boom, he says, will reassert itself, shocking universally negative forecasters. Of course, it is possible I will be wrong, he says. We have not encountered such a crisis since the Spanish flu in 1918. There could be second waves. We might not find a vaccine and tensions between China and the US could escalate into a military conflict. But, he says, that is not my central case. And I just want to comment there, of course, that CoreLogic recently signalled that they may withdraw their daily index because of low transaction volumes. So in a way, I'm not sure whether that index really provides any guidance as to what is currently going on. And the second point is that the hope of a quick rebound and an economic bounce back is not one that is widely shared by a number of other commentators. So I would put joy at the bullish end of the market once again, but I think there are a number of reasons why he may on this occasion be too bullish. Now, we also got another week's data from the Fed as the assets on their balance sheet rose by a further 205 billion US dollars during the week ending April the 22nd to reach $6.57 trillion. Since the 11th of March, the Fed has printed $2.26 trillion. And if the Fed had spread that $2.26 trillion equally over 130 million households in the US, then each would have received $17,380. 
Now, the 205 billion increase was the smallest since the massive liquidity support programs began. Looking across the programs, they are tapering their purchases of treasury securities and mortgage backed securities. The demand for repos is easing, and loans via the special purpose vehicles have topped out. Foreign central bank liquidity swaps moved only slightly higher this week. This front loading was signalled and expected Fed Chair Jerome Powell early in April said that the Fed would pack away its emergency tools when private markets and institutions are once again able to perform their vital functions of channeling credit and supporting economic growth. The Fed added $120 billion of Treasury securities to its balance sheet, the smallest amount since this began, down 67% from the $362 billion it had added during the peak week. Demand for repos has abated, total repo balances fell to $157 billion, down 64% from the peak of $442 billion. The Fed has dollar liquidity swap lines with the Bank of Japan, the ECB and the central banks of England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, Singapore, South Korea, Brazil and Mexico. The combined amounts of these swaps increased by just $31 billion from the prior week. Of note, the Bank of Japan is the largest counterparty, with $195 billion in liquidity swaps, or 49% of the total. The ECB, with $142 billion in swaps, accounts for 32% of the total, and the Bank of England is in third place at 6.3%, with $27 billion. The RBA, in comparison, has $1.1 billion and 0.26% of the total. No swaps with the central banks of Canada, Brazil, New Zealand and Sweden have been made, and the Fed lends newly created dollars to a central bank, which posts newly created domestic currency at the Fed as collateral. The exchange rate is the market rate at the time of the contract. The swaps come with two types of maturity, 7 days or 84 days. When the swaps mature, the Fed collects its dollars and the other central bank collects its own currency. The Fed books these swaps on its balance sheet in dollars at the exchange rate in the agreement. And the Fed has slashed its purchase of mortgage-backed securities over the past three weeks from $157 billion on March the 25th to $56 billion on April the 22nd, with a total of $1.62 trillion. This $54 billion increase is a mix of mortgage-backed security trades that the Fed did in prior weeks and just now settled, minus paydowns and refinances. Hi, excuse the interruption, but if you're getting value from this post and have not done so, please consider subscribing to this channel or ring the bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. Alternatively, you can also donate using Bitcoin. Here is the QR code. The links are in the comments below. I really appreciate your support, which enables us to continue to make more great content. Thanks very much. Now back to the current show. Finally, a quick market review. The Dow snapped a two-week winning streak despite closing higher on Friday, led by a Facebook-infused rally in tech stocks ahead of major tech earnings due next week. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 1.11%. The S&P 500 rose 1.39%, while the Nasdaq Composite gained 1.65%. Facebook closed 2.7% higher after rolling out a group video chat feature called Messenger Rooms as the social media giant looks to cash in on the ramp up in demand for video conferences amid lockdown measures. Zoom video communications reversed gains to end down 6%. With major tech earnings hitting the tape next week, Alphabet Apple and Amazon also ended higher. The surge in tech stocks, however, wasn't able to prevent the broader market from falling to its first weekly loss in three weeks, following declines earlier in the week amid a historical plunge in oil prices. Companies across a range of industries are slashing or suspending dividends to cope with the economic fallout from the virus, complicating the stock selection process for money managers eager to buttress their portfolios with a steady stream of income.
The S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats Index, which tracks companies that have increased dividends annually for the past 25 years and includes Exxon and Chevron, has fallen about 19% so far in 2020. As of Thursday, greater than the 12.9% drop over that time for the S&P 500 Total Return Index. That's bad news for yield thirsty investors at the time when payouts on US Treasuries stand near historic lows as the Federal Reserve keeps interest rates in check to stimulate the economy. The S&P 500's dividend yield recently exceeded the yield on the benchmark 10-year US Treasuries by its highest margin in nearly five decades. Adding to the surge in jobless claims earlier this week, a slump in US durable goods orders provided further evidence of the economic downturn, which will likely be severe. US durable goods order fell by 14.4% last month, the biggest slide since 2014, led by waning demand for big ticket items such as cars and a slump in orders for Boeing passenger planes. The weekend expected data comes just as President Donald Trump signed the $484 billion stimulus package into law to ease the hit on the economy at a time when some states are just about ready to reopen. But US Treasury Secretary Minchin acknowledged that he is considering efforts to support US oil producers. It's not clear if such a program will be run out of the Treasury Department or another facility that the Fed runs with Treasury money as a backstop. Meanwhile, at least 13 meat processing plants have closed due to the virus, and this is impacting roughly 10% of US beef production and 25% of pork production. This is affecting the supply chains and prices. And the Federal Reserve's effort to unlock the funding market beginning to show clear effects with the benchmark three-month dollar LIBOR below 1% for the first time in over a month. The swap lines with foreign central banks continue to be used. There is a bit more than $430 billion outstanding. One program that has not been used is the repo lines the Fed offered. So foreign central banks has an alternative to selling their treasury holdings. The volatility index, which measures the implied volatility of the S&P 500 options, was down 13.17% to 35.93. That's a new one month low. And oil prices settled 2.7% higher though still ended the week 7% lower after settling in negative for the first time ever on Monday. And they landed at 17.19 a barrel. Gold futures for June delivery were up 0.01% to 1,745. And the euro US dollar was up 0.42% to 1.0821, while the US dollar index futures was down 0.27%. The Bank of Japan has resisted deflationary forces. And the pandemic will make this task more difficult. The March CPI figures showed core inflation, which excludes fresh food prices, eased to 0.4% from 0.6% in February. Excluding fresh food and energy, the CPI was unchanged at 0.6%. However, the sales tax increase imposed last October and the free preschool initiative distorts measured inflation. If these are stripped out, Core inflation, which is what the BOJ targets, fell to 0.1%. And separately, Japan reported on its All Industry Activity Index, which is a sort of proxy for GDP, and it fell by 0.6% in February, after rising as much in January, revised from 0.8%. Also, Japan reported that department store sales plunged by more than a third in March. And lastly, the Tokyo governor is encouraging an extension of the Golden Week holidays starting as soon as tomorrow to keep social distancing that slows the spread of the virus. The People's Bank of China injected funds into their banking system via the targeted one-year medium-term lending facility at 2.95%. This reflects the 20 basis point rate cuts seen in other facilities over the last few weeks. It does not signal a new round of easing, but that is likely to be forthcoming as well. A new Bloomberg survey found the median GDP forecast for this year has been halved to 1.8% from 3.7%. And last month, UK March retail sales fell the most on record, including petrol. Retail sales fell 5.1% on the month, excluding auto fuel, 
Retail sales fell 3.7%. Only food stores, pharmacies and other essential businesses were open by the end of the month. Clothing sales were hit among the hardest, down by over a third, and food sales jumped over 10%, and alcohol sales surged by more than 31%. And note that this does not include supermarket sales, where the majority of alcohol is bought in the UK. Online sales rose by 8%. The Australian dollar is little changed on the day around the quarter cent range, centred on 63.60. It is virtually unchanged on the week, after settling last week near 63.65. And finally, all eyes are on the Eurozone as European leaders failed to come to an agreement on a comprehensive economic relief package for the economic area, disappointing investors as markets grew increasingly frustrated with policymakers' inability to respond to the crisis. The EU Council did agree to let the EU Commission formulate a relief plan and figure out ways to finance it, but it's clear that the Northern Bloc, led by Germany and the Netherlands, are resisting any notion of shared fiscal responsibility that would distribute the burden of financing on those countries that run fiscal and trade surpluses. Yet, that precisely what needs to be done if Europe is to have any chance of surviving as a single economic bloc. One of the greatest ironies of the Euro project is that it is the very countries that have massively benefited from a unified currency that are now the catalysts for its possible demise. Germany now needs to decide if it wants to be German or European. There is no doubt the political costs for financing the free spending of Italians and Spanish would be very steep for Merkel. But the alternative will be much worse. Germany is the world's greatest export nation on a per capita basis. And if the economy was forced to go back to the Deutschmark, its primary engine of growth would collapse under the much higher currency exchange regime. For now, Germany continues to insist on enjoying the friction-free unified currency regime protection of the euro without shouldering the financial burden for the bloc. But with the virus having thrown the whole continent into an unprecedented economic depression, the days of kicking the can down the road are probably over. Europe needs a fiscal stimulus package of at least 3 trillion euros just to restart its economy, and perhaps the compromise solution will be a clandestine MMT rescue, with the Eurozone not issuing euro bonds, but each sovereign issuing its own bonds, with the ECB buying up the full supply in each state. It's hard to imagine how the bond markets won't be able to see through that ploy, but barring a change of stance from the Germans, that may be the only interim solution to save the euro. So, to sum up, wherever you look, the economic pressures are rising, even as the virus, still not fully controlled, is actually calling the shots. Could it be that in a match between nature and and the markets, nature might just win. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.